John Barnett here, and welcome to week 49. And I was just sharing with my wonderful wife, Bonnie, who's sitting over there um, behind the desk recording all this, that I can't believe how timely this lesson is. We're getting really close to the end of the 52 weeks that we're going through the key chapters of the Bible and surveying the whole Bible. But this week, as I, as I read through 1 John and as I studied and, and, of course, wrote in my notebook, and I would encourage all of you uh, that are going along with this on this journey, if you really want to make the most of it, get a, some type of notebook that you can carry with you wherever you go to the coffee shop when you travel on vacation so you never get behind. And then tape in the front right here, all the, the guide to what we're doing, the instructions and, and what you're looking for. And then whenever you're working uh, through the scriptures, record what you're finding. And that's, I was telling Bonnie, this was a perfectly timed week. So let's, let's start with the slides and I'm gonna show you where we're going before I go to the marker boards behind me. Uh, we're looking at the deity of Jesus Christ, which is the heart of the gospel. Now here, here is what uh, really got my attention this week. How to avoid, look at this, Satan's most powerful deceptions. Now what you see in the slide, everybody always wonders the picture I, I choose there. This is the great theater at Ephesus. So do you remember, and, and look up for just a second, I'll remind you, when you grab your Bible and read it, every one of the books that you read, there, there is a context, a background to it. The Apostle John spent his last years, other than his imprisonment time on Patmos, he spent his last years in Ephesus. That's why I showed you that theater. So most likely, from the shadow of that theater and the great temple that we talk about when, when I go through Ephesians and the book of Acts, the Apostle John was writing the Gospel by John he wrote the three epistles by John, and he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ from his time, both at, at uh, Ephesus and then being captured and sent off to Patmos, and that's when he did the revelation of John. So back to the slide. When you see the great theater there in Ephesus, you're looking at where Paul had his greatest ministry, his three-year ministry there in Ephesus, and where Timothy, so now let's think about it, Paul was here, Timothy was here, and Timothy was a pastor here, and then John was here, and that's not all. Mary was here. Remember, John was entrusted with Mary at the cross, and Jesus said, you know, woman, behold, uh, you know, your son, and, and son, behold, your mother, and, and John took the oversight of Mary to take care of her as a widow after Joseph was gone. This is the most visible part of Ephesus. So that's what I wanted you to see in the background. Okay, we're on week 49. We're looking at 1 John, only really covering every verse of uh, chapter 1. But what we're looking at is this. The key to understanding the true gospel is knowing who Jesus Christ is. And that's the only way, as Jesus warned us, to avoid Satan's most powerful deceptions. Now, here's where we are, week 49. And remember, I always uh, make a, a short phrase describing the portion of scripture we're in. And so I wrote the first time that I went through 1 John, I wrote the basis for joy and true fellowship. And I'll show you how I got to that. Now, I have several more titles and I'll show them to you on the board in just a minute. Uh, what we're doing is we're surveying the whole Bible. And, and this might be your very first week with us. Well, if you want, you can go through the whole Bible by joining us for the 52 greatest chapters. And we do one a week of these great chapters, or you can take longer. Some people take longer. I get your notes and you say, oh, I've taken two weeks. And I say, great, but just keep going and finish. But here's the key. We're using the devotional method. And the devotional method, you write down that title for each chapter, and you can have many titles. It's just what in that read through, what really stirs your heart and captures the essence of what you just studied. And then every time you read, you're looking for as many lessons, truths, and doctrines as you can find. And I highly recommend you invest the time and money to get a good study Bible. 
Uh, or if you like the MacArthur Study Bible, or you use an online free resource like the Blue Letter Bible, and there are many of them, just make sure they're a good, solid one. And uh, you can also get, and, and there's a free version of this, Logos, uh, which is another you know, beautiful software. I use it all the time, carry it in my pocket, on my phone, on my laptop, desktop. But you look for those lessons, and then from them, look at this, you, you take the points that you find and make them into an application prayer. And you don't just pray it in your mind, you write it out, actually asking the Lord himself to unleash at least one of those truths uh, that, that you have personally found into changing your life. And that's what makes this study amazing. Okay, look up for a second before I go through the summary. I want to just kind of show you why I got so excited this week. Uh, the first thing is over here on this board, remember when you are reading the Bible and getting to the, the uh, first John, first, second, third John, Gospel of John and Revelation, those five books, you're, you're looking at the last apostle. That's John. He's the last living apostle. We're studying this week the very last epistle of the New Testament. This is the very last one. Now that should get your attention. God knew this is the last time he could send a message in an epistle form to all of the churches. Now we have the seven letters of Jesus to the seven letters of, of Asia Minor in Revelation. That's future. This is the very last of the normal church epistles. So John is writing as a pastor, he's the pastor and, and probably emeritus because he's quite elderly, of the church in Ephesus after Paul founded it, after Timothy built it, and after all those years, John nurtured it. So the last apostles writing the last epistle, he's already finished the last gospel. Now the gospel by John, Matthew's already been written, Mark's already been written, Luke's already been written uh, many years before. This is the very last of the gospels, the gospel by John. And by the way, we'll see in 1 John that, that all the truths of the gospel, he's kind of summarizing and using in his message in 1 John. And then it's the last book of the Bible that's coming from him in Revelation. So John is so important. The last apostle wrote the last epistle to the churches, wrote the last gospel account of Christ, and finally concludes the whole canon of scripture, the Bible. Now, look over here. Uh, this is the next title I got. Um, and I showed it to you on the opening slide. Remember I said joy and fellowship. Well, now after reading through 1 John, I realized it's the deity of Christ that's, that's the heart of the gospel. And, and that takes me, I'm going to refer to this resource. And this is the Rose Publishing. You can see it right down here in the bottom corner. Pamphlet. Look at this. I have every one of these that they've made. Okay. I, I first bumped into these when I was at, at Shepherd's Conference at Grace Community Church. And they were selling these on a table. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, they're, they're waterproof, they're flexy, they're compact, they can fit right into my Bible. Look at that. They're Bible-sized. They fit right into my Bible. But uh, look, look down at this summary uh, slide, and I'm going to run through it with you. And then I'm going to show you what's on this rose chart. Okay, this is what I started with you. The last apostle is writing the last epistle. And by the way, 1 John, uh, in your MacArthur Study Bible, you'll see that the date on it and in Logos is between 90 and 95 AD. He has already written the last of the four Gospels, sometime between 80 and 90 AD. John writes the Gospel by John. He's soon to be imprisoned on Patmos by Domitian. Now, from history... I mean, you can look in a history book, Encyclopedia Britannica, or on Wikipedia, and you'll see that Domitian's intense persecution of the church started in 95. And there, during that persecution, John is put on Patmos as a prisoner, and he writes, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, the last book of the Bible, probably uh, in 96. Because uh, sometime between that year and 98, Church history says that John uh, was welcome home to heaven. So amazing to think about all that he did, and especially this climactic time period uh, when he is writing this last epistle, 
uh, after he finished the gospel and he's writing Revelation and uh, in his captivity on Patmos. So look at the next paragraph. In this epistle, John explains why he wrote. And I actually want to show you these in, in the scriptures so you can mark them. This is one of the lessons we learn when we do the devotional method. We look for repetition. And four times John says the very same things. He says, these things are written, or I have written these things, or I wrote for this purpose. So he tells us four truths why he wrote through this repeated phrase, and this is what I call him, the gateway to freedom for those living through the growing darkness, the hostility, and the temptations. And here's what John explains, uh, those four truths. These are the four reasons he wrote. He says, I write unto you, and first he talks about freedom from emptiness. Now, look up uh, from the slide and, and look at 1 John 1, 4. And I want, take the time, grab a pen, and, and underline this repeated phrase, okay? Uh, it says in verse 4, these things we write to you. These things, the Holy Spirit's inspiring me, and we, it could very possibly be that John's sight is bad and, and everything, that he had an amanuensis, a, a, a secretary, write it, and it could be why he says we, or probably the, the better thought for that is that he's talking about we. He said, God is speaking through me. It's his words, and it's coming out to you. So we're, you know, God and me are writing to you. So either God and me with a secretary or God and me to you. doesn't matter which it is, but look what he says, verse 4. We're writing to this. Why? That your joy may be full. Now, look here on the board. This is freedom from emptiness. That's 1 John 1, 4. The gateway to freedom from emptiness is what we're studying this week. I mean, that ought to get your attention. You ought to want to spend all week long in 1 John. Did you know that emptiness is what is the affliction that, that most humans are struggling with? They feel empty in their marriage. They feel empty at work. They feel empty in their, you know, their whatever they like to do, their hobbies or their pursuits. They feel empty emotionally. They feel empty. And Christ said, I don't want you to be empty. I came that you might have life, and not just life, overflowing life, abundant life. In fact, Jesus, I'll show you in just a second when we get back to the slides. Jesus actually said, I want you to be like a, a river of water that gushes up and overflows your life like a fountain. Number one, 1 John 1, 4. Do you want to be free from an empty life? Feeling unfulfilled, unsatisfied, restless, aimless, empty? The gateway to freedom from emptiness is the reason that God asked John to write this letter and breathed it out through him. Wow. Back to the slides. Remember, Jesus has already said our lives are to overflow. Way back when we were going through John 7, I read this, but it says, On the last, the great day of the feast, Jesus said, Out of you will flow rivers of living water. But look what it says in verse 10. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and life more abundant. I want you free from emptiness in the gateway is right here in 1 John. Okay, secondly, see number two here? 1 John 2, 1, freedom from guilt. Now remember, Jesus, who said, neither do I condemn you to the woman taken in adultery. Look up here on the board. Freedom from guilt, 1 John 2, 1. Let's open, turn in your Bible there. Uh, I've told you this many times. The chapter divisions were put in by Bishop Langton. He's the same one that wrote the Magna Carta in England, okay? He was the Archbishop of Canterbury, an amazing scholar, uh, an English, uh, just prolific writer, English-speaking Church of England leader. And he took the Bible that was just one long, you know, manuscript and chopped it into chapters. Now, some of them are pretty clear, like the Psalms. But other times, like 1 John, he just arbitrarily cut it wherever. And so if you have a modern version, the Greek actual manuscript has paragraphs in it 
that don't match the verses or the chapters, but they were put in by Langton so that people in the Church of England could read the Bible through once a year. He had this Bible reading program, and I would still strongly encourage you to read through. In fact, wonderful Bonnie and I this morning, uh, we go through the MacArthur Daily Bible, and it's just already done for us. There's an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, a Psalm reading, a proverb reading, and then an application of all that. And it takes, how long, honey? 15, 15 to 18 minutes a day. And we pray before, and then we read, and then we discuss, and then we, we actually seek to invite the Lord to transform our life. But that whole Bible reading as a church on a regular basis was encouraged by Langton, who put in the chapters. So look in your Bible. My Little Children is right in the middle of this whole section. It just, Langton, what I like to say is he was riding a horse and, and sometimes while the horse was going along. But uh, the next thing it says in verse one, my little children, these things I write unto you that you may not sin. Now look down at the slide. This is freedom from guilt. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. He said that to the woman taken adultery. And, and that's what John is saying. Uh, that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, verse 1 continues, we have an advocate with the Father. Now look at this third one, freedom from deceptions. Now remember, Satan is a liar. Remember it says in 844, he is a liar and the father of it, a murderer. He comes to kill and steal and destroy. That's what it says in John 10, 10. So freedom from deceptions. Now look up and let me show you verse 26 in your Bible. By the way, where did the verses come from? Langton did the, the uh, chapter divisions in the 12th century. By the time we get to the 16th century, guess what? We have the printing press. Gutenberg was you know, doing the printing press, and by the time the Bible started being printed commercially, Robert Stephanus from Geneva put in all these verse divisions. And, and look what it says in the verse division Stephanus put in, in verse 26. These things I have written to you. Now, in my Bible, if you could see it, I have a little number one by verse four of chapter one. I have a little number two by two one, and now I have a little number three by 226. And I wrote by 226, I said, freedom from deceptions. These things I've written unto you concerning those who try and deceive you. How do we have freedom from deceptions? Look at verse 27. The anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true. What he's talking about is what we all have, the indwelling teaching of the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. He's a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. That's orthodox doctrine, and that's what we're just emphasizing in this course. And John told them, you don't need some secret initiation into some secret group, the cults that were uh, besieging the early church with all their errors. He said, no, you don't need to go off to some secret teacher who will reveal some hidden truth. You, wherever you are, can just bow your head and lift your heart to God and say, open my eyes, help me to behold your truth. And immediately the Spirit of God illumines our hearts to the scripture. So you should have in your Bible a little number one and put freedom from emptiness by chapter one, verse four, a little number two, freedom from guilt, a little number three, freedom from deceptions through the anointing, which reminds me, not everybody that watches these videos are Christians. In fact, I just shared last night with Bonnie that I keep track of notes and postings and emails and texts and phone calls that Bonnie and I get. And since COVID started, uh, when it first we started seeing it on the news, uh, you know, at like Christmas of 2019, and then full blown by March when they closed everything down in 2020. Since then, from 2020 until today, over the weekend, we just saw the 100th person, 100 people have written to us and said that during COVID, I couldn't go to work, I, I was working remotely, or we couldn't get out of the house. And we started watching videos and, and somehow they came on these videos on YouTube 
and 100 people have said, I came to know Jesus Christ. Uh, I've told you stories. One of them raised their hand on the subway. Uh, the most recent one I got was from San Francisco. And they said that they were, the, the boyfriend got saved, changed so radically, his girlfriend asked him what happened to him. He said, you need to watch this YouTube channel. And, and she came to Gospel by John chapter 10. That's the lesson she picked. And I was going through, my sheep hear my voice. And I said that, that you can cry out to Jesus, the good shepherd, and he'll save you. And guess what this couple sent me? A video clip, actually a link to a video clip from a church in downtown San Francisco, a gospel preaching church, where this young lady was baptized uh, following the Lord in his death, burial, and resurrection uh, in, a, in a beautiful little Bible church. Wow. Freedom from deception. At the instant of salvation, the spirit of truth enters us. The spirit of God, who is the spirit of truth, lives within us. And verse 27 says, he anoints us with truth. Okay, back to the slides. Here's the last one we're going to go to. It says in 1 John 5, 13, we can have freedom from fear. Jesus said, remember, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in John 14, 2. He reminded his disciples, he said, fear not. Don't be troubled or afraid. How do you do that? By abiding connected to me. That's chapter 15. Remember I said... Look at this, John 7, John 10. I said, John is giving little snips of kind of little uh, summaries from the gospel that he'd already written in all of these verses you see on this uh, chart. But this, these four are the reasons why he wrote this letter. Now look up and let's read this one right here and, and make sure you pause the, the video, get your pen out. In fact, I have a a fine point pen that I write uh, really small. I don't know if you can see it right there, but I write with a fine point, number four, freedom from fear, chapter five, verse 13. So this is what it says. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that's assurance, not be constantly afraid. I meet Christians who say, I'm not sure I'm saved, or I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, or I'm not sure the Lord's going to forgive me that sin, or I'm not sure, you know, I'm anxious about the end of the world. We should be the most peaceful, confident, joyful, bold people in the world. Why? Verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Wow. And boy, the promises that follow that in verse 14 and 15, great. Okay, back down to the slides. Four reasons John wrote this book. He, God wants us to have freedom from emptiness, and this is the gateway to freedom from emptiness, freedom from guilt, freedom from deceptions, and freedom from fear. Okay, next slide. Look where we are. Right here is where uh, this epistle is being written. Right here is where the gospel is written. See, this is AD 90. Uh, this is where Revelation is being written. Uh, all of the gospels are finished and spread widely by the time of Revelation. And so we're looking at this time between all the apostles going off the scene and only John is left. But what's the message of God for every believer? First John is how to live for God in an ever darkening world. And that's what we live in today. Now remember the context is right here. We're in Asia Minor. Now come over here to my uh, map and I'll show you. Uh, this is the Roman province of Asia. And you can see it right here. Uh, this is the, the time periods down here in this map. And, and I love this map. And this is a map that, that I've used both for our uh, study tour through the Gospels, which is the video study tour. And coming up soon, it's going to be the map that we use for our Life and Letters of Paul. But right here is the, the area that these letters were written by Jesus through John and Revelation. This is where 1 John was written, 2 John, 3 John, and the Gospel by John, right here in the Roman province of Asia. And you can see it again on the slide right there. And Patmos is right off the coast of Asia Minor. This, again, is Patmos right there. Do you see it? 
And right here, this star is Ephesus. So right here is where John in Roman Asia pastored uh, the church in Ephesus. Then, and he wrote the gospel, and then he wrote the epistles, and then he is captured by Domitian and put out here, and he writes the book of the Revelation, and then church history tells us he came back to Ephesus and the Lord called him home. The dark days of deception are coming, and as the end of the world approaches, so does earth's darkest hour. Revelation tells us hell will open and the pit will vomit out its demon hordes. And in next week, we're going to start Revelation, so make sure you stick with us to the end. But other beasts from the abyss will wreak death and destruction globally, and we spend three weeks on that book. But look at this. Satan himself invades the earth and conquers it at last. At the helm, the visible leader of the world, and this is Revelation 13, will be the long-promised man of sin, the lawless one, the beast, the coming world leader, commonly known as the Antichrist. Now, look up for a second, get your Bible, and I want you to see how important it is to tie together this epistle with the next three weeks in Revelation. Look at 1 John 2.18. It says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Notice, the and a capital A. That's a person, okay? So a person who wants to take Christ's place. He is an anti, that means in place of Christ. He is one that, that says, I'm the Christ you should be following. I'm the one that, that you've always waited for. Now keep reading. There's a second kind of antichrist. Look at verse 18. Even now, many antichrists. Now, now look at this. Antichrists and the antichrist. There are two different groups talked about here. Look here with me at 1 John 2.18, and this, this differentiates between these two. It says, little children, it is the last hour. The apostle John believed he was in the last hour. That's the strength of the early church. That's what's so important, that we live every day like it could be the day that Christ returns. But listen what he says. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Isn't that interesting? That was the first lesson. Eschatology was the first lesson that Paul taught new believers. He taught them, this world is not your home. We're looking forward to the place prepared for us in heaven. We're just passing through. We're supposed to live every day expecting Christ is going to interrupt the day. Boy, has that fallen on hard times. You don't hear that taught in churches anymore. In fact, half of all the churches in America don't think that should be taught. And yet, he said, it's the last hour, verse 18. The Antichrist is coming, and many Antichrists are here already. And that's how we know it's the last hour. What are those many Antichrists? Well, remember, those are oppositions to the gospel and to Christ. It's all of those who don't believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe in his virgin birth. They don't believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ. They don't believe that he is the creator, and they don't believe in creation. All of those are antichrist. All of those are opposing the gospel. Do you remember, and, and by the way, the next three weeks we're studying Revelation. By the time we get to the third of those three weeks, the last week, we're going to be in chapter 14 of Revelation. And when God gets to preach the gospel through the voice of an angel flying around the world at the crescendo of the tribulation, do you remember what he says? I'll, I'll let you know what is coming, okay? Look at chapter 14 in your Bible. Now, we're not in Revelation, but I'm so excited to show this to you. 14.6, kind of like John 14.6, this is Revelation 14.6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. This is very important. To those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, what is the everlasting gospel? This is, this is straight from God, sent through an angel uh, with no human you know, error possible. Look at this. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. When God preaches the gospel with 
a global message to everybody that the last hope they have for salvation is to worship the Creator. Beware of those Antichrist who oppose the true gospel, the everlasting gospel of the Creator, of the Redeemer, of the Substitute, of the divine 100% human, 100% God, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, back down to the slides. At the helm of the world, during these dark days coming, will be the Antichrist. There are 33 titles of him in the Old Testament, 13 in the New Testament, but behind him, the real power is the God of this world, the dragon, old Lucifer, the lying serpent of Eden. And the Bible clearly teaches, and that's what I just read to you in 1 John 2.18, that we can expect this invasion from the pit in the last days. And during the final days, most people, it says, will be led away by evil spirits and cult teachings. That's what it says in actually 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says that deceiving spirits. But the shadows of these times are already darkening our world. Nothing but the restraining presence of God the Holy Spirit holds back the floodgates of this time of evil. And remember, way back uh, 49 weeks ago when we studied Genesis, advanced demonism was the mark of Noah's day, and it's becoming an increasingly evident characteristic of the age in which we live. Remember what Jesus said, as it was in the days of uh, Noah? Okay, now look at this slide. We have the writing of the apostolic fathers, the early church leaders, uh, Barnabas, Clement of Rome, and Ignatius. But look at this. This is what was happening that John was writing about. The rise of Gnostic heresies within the church. Now, look up for a second. Some of you are saying, wait a minute, where did that slide come from? It came from another resource. This is, and and I showed you this uh, at the beginning of class. I showed you this one, and I'm going to show you even more. But this is another one of these little uh, beautiful flexi charts that Rose Publications makes. And I'm on the very last panel of it right here. This is the very ending of it. And that's what you see on the the slide I'm going to show you. And it talks about all of the different eras. That's why it's called a Bible timeline. So for those of you that are teaching classes, those of you that are teaching Sunday school, those of you that are part of small groups, these little flexi guides are so helpful. They're like uh, a summary of a whole Bible course in seminary on the deity of Christ and cults and on a biblical timeline of creation and the flood and future events. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, What's going on? that John is writing about is the Antichrist were denying Jesus' humanity. It's called doketism, saying that he merely appeared to have a body. And they also claimed this secret knowledge beyond divine revelation and faith, that you didn't need just the Bible. And that's right up just about the time of John's death, uh, this Gnostic uh, view was rising. And you can read about that in that little uh, pamphlet. What's the only defense? And that's why we're studying 1 John. Healthy doctrine. Healthy doctrine. We need to be looking at healthy doctrine. Do you remember uh, the story about the frog that landed in the pan of water and stayed till it got boiled? Well, the longer I live, the more alarmed I am at the trend of biblical illiteracy and the lack of discipleship in today's church. Just as there's a decline in church attendance, Bible reading, even Bible carrying, Uh, In each new generation, there's a corresponding decline in even knowing the Bible, that's biblical literacy, and obeying God's word, that's biblical discipleship. And it's making woefully powerless lives in so many believers. And here's just Barna, you know, the, the pollster. This is what he said from people that call themselves Christian. Less than half of all people in America who say they're a Christian No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A majority of professing Christians struggle to identify more than two or three disciples. You know, they know Peter, James, and John maybe, and they don't know any more. They can't name even half the Ten Commandments. This is horrible. They think that Jesus was a sinner. He became sin. He never sinned. Forty percent of people that call themselves Christians aren't Christians because they don't believe in the 
the deity of Jesus Christ, that he was sinless. Uh, 50% of all people that say they're Christians think that anyone who's generally good or does enough good for others will earn a place in heaven. And the Bible says heaven can't be earned. Look at this, 40% believe the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon are all different expressions of the same spiritual truth. All of that is dangerous, heresy, and wrong. What's the solution to spiritual deception coming from every direction because of lack of doctrine and discipleship? God's solution is the same. We're seeing it right here in 1 John. In this final epistle to the church, God leads John to show us Every believer in Christ's church needs to be nurtured in God's word. That's why we're in this course. That's why you study your Bibles. That's why we go to church. That's why we're in small groups. But we're supposed to be nurtured until we're, we're mature enough to discern the truth. In other words, we, we get a framework. Uh, we understand it from the scriptures. We embrace it in our minds. We then become defenders against deception. We become like, remember, Acts 17.11, we examine the scriptures, no matter whose book we're reading, no matter who is preaching. They examine Paul. We examine everybody, every message we get, every uh, church service, small group, everybody that shares against the scriptures. And then all of us are responsible to disciple someone else to do the same. Now look up for just a second. I've said this 49 times. See, we're on week 49. I said, you should be taking the time to study the scriptures, write down your findings, and find someone to share it with. We need to learn to face-to-face -face interact with people and either be, and, and I always show you my gospel track here, either be seeking to lead them to Christ uh, this morning. Uh, I was up at 4.30, went to the coffee shop early, and I was busily doing my, my study that I'm sharing with you. And all of a sudden, this retired veteran saw my Bible, and boy, did he start talking to me. He says, tell me, you know, he says, what do you think about, and he started naming all these different books and television and everything. And I had in my wallet, look, well, I'll just get my wallet out. Here's my wallet I had with me. Look what's right here. My track. And I, every week, pray over one of these tracks and say, Lord, who do you want me to share this with? And this morning, Ted was the man that the Lord gave me the burden to pray the Lord would open his heart to the gospel. Okay, back down here. We should be discipling people to do the same. That's why I encourage you to go through the study and share it with someone. So here's my Bible. And, and I would strongly, strongly encourage you, get a Bible, look down in the description of this video, it has our recommendations on Amazon. You can go to your local bookstore, but they always say, well, what, what are you looking for? And you can read about it, you know, take a picture, a screenshot or something, what you're looking for. This is just a normal Bible. Of course, I've duct taped mine, but look, I write in it. Now, this is one of, of many. I have, here's another one over here. I have many of these Bibles. Look at this one. Whoop, this one's falling apart. <laughs> I shouldn't pick it up. But um, I use, I'll use it with both hands. See, I use highlighters in many of these. And I highlight key words that are being repeated. Um, I look for, like in this one, what I wrote is, I, I counted repeated words. I said that earlier in the class. Love, 45 times in 1 John. Sin, 28 times. World, 22 times. Command, 14 times. Life, 12 times. Light, 6 times. Fellowship, 4 times. I'm looking for what God is emphasizing. And then I even daisy chain. I draw circles and lines. You say, what are you doing all that stuff for? I want with all my heart to know and understand and obey the truth of the, of the Word of God. And I, I want to spend enough time to, to master everything that's possible to know from this book. All of you are mastering something. Some of you are mastering sports. You're mastering cars. You're mastering music. Some of you are mastering gaming. You're mastering business. You're mastering whatever. Now, it's good. 
to have a profession and to have a skill and everything else. But the reason we're here on earth, once we get saved, is to be living like we're waiting every day for Jesus to return. And I hope that this course will stir your heart to get into this book and mark it and earnestly ask the Lord to conform you more to Christ. That's what I want for my life. Okay, back to the slides. That's my Bible, all marked up, and I hope yours is. Here's my journal, and uh, I typed it out for you. Remember, uh, the week we're on, I put that at the top of the page, then the, uh, the chapter we're studying. Now look at this, I told you I change my title all the time, look at this. This was this morning's, the only gateway to freedom from emptiness, guilt, and deceptions, and fear. And, and how, do we, how do we get away from emptiness, guilt, and deceptions, and fear? Because the ultimate security against Satan's Antichrist is confessing the true Christ. Let's start through 1 John. Look at verse 1, and, and I'll read it to you. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now look down at the slides. Jesus is God's word. John says this in the Gospel of John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and right here in his epistle, he says the same thing. Jesus is the word of life. He is the word that brings life. He is the one that quickens the, the word of God in our hearts. Now look at verse 2. Jesus is the only way to endless life. Jesus is eternal life. Let me read to you verse 2. The life was manifested, and we have seen, we bear witness, we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. Do you remember what John said in the Gospel by John? He says in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, even Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, back to sites. Jesus is the word of God. He's the only way to endless life. And that's why I'm showing you especially this resource, Christianity, Cults, and Religion. Here's the index. When, you know, I hold it up, but this is what I'm looking at. First, a definition of what biblical Christianity is. Then every cult, it goes through Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Unification Church, Christian Science, Unity, New Age, Wicca, Scientology, Islam, Nation of Islam, Baha'i, Judaism, Kabbalah, Hinduism, Hare Krishna, TM, Transcendental Meditation, Sikhism, Buddhism, uh, Soka, Gakkai, and what the Bible teaches. Now, look up. Everything I just read you is in one little tiny pamphlet. I mean, if you are at all out in the marketplace of the world, you're going to run into people that are Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, you'll run into Mormons, or they'll run into you, they'll come to your door. And, and what this guide does is, it has the key person, founder, date, location, the key writings, who is God, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, how to be saved, what happens at death, and other facets, starting with biblical Christianity. So this is a summary of everything we believe. And then it's contrasted with what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, who do they believe Jesus is? Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is not God. He was Michael the Archangel before he came to earth. Can you believe that? How about Mormons? Uh, Jesus is a separate God from the Father Elohim. He was created as a spirit child by the Father and Mother in heaven and his elder brother of all men beings, including Lucifer. He's the elder brother of Lucifer? Jesus and Satan are brothers? That's just the first page. And, and it shows where in their writings, their sacred writings, all this comes from. It does the same thing for Seventh-day Adventism, unification, Christian science, all the way through. Amazing. Look, fits right inside your Bible, right inside the cover. So I strongly recommend these resources. Um, back to the slides. Verse 3, John says, knowing God is salvation. It says in 1 John 1, 3, remember, these are my lessons I find. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Wow. 
what he's saying is the only basis for fellowship is orthodox doctrine, orthodox belief about Christ. That's why you need a resource like this. Not all these people that are friendly and nice are going to heaven. They don't confess the truth, the Bible says, about Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to be able to discern, truth from error, deception. Remember, Jesus warned most about deceivers. Today, there are many, many people who are opposed to the true gospel of Christ. And we need to study our Bible, mark it, and find these resources to identify the cults and the antichrists of our day. Okay, back down to the slide. John 17, 3, of course, uh, says, this is life eternally, they may know thee. And it says in John 14, 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and uh, I will love him, and we will manifest ourselves to him. That's the fellowship we can have with God the Father. Then in verse 4, true believers know Jesus really rose from the dead bodily. And that's the purpose of 1 John, that we live in fullness of joy. Let me read to you verse 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. What? What, what is he talking about? Well, what he just said. What we have seen and heard in verse 3, we declare to you that verse 2, Jesus was manifest. We have seen him. We bear witness. Verse 1, we heard him, we saw with our eyes, our hands have handled. He said, Jesus really rose from the dead. I saw him. I felt him. I talked to him. He says, I, I made sure he had a real body. That's the only way, verse 4, to have fullness of joy. It's the gateway. Look at this. The gateway to freedom from emptiness is salvation. The gateway to freedom from guilt is salvation. The gateway to freedom from deception is salvation. When the Holy Spirit anoints us and indwells us, the gateway to freedom from fear is salvation. See, the whole book of 1 John says that the gateway to God is through Jesus Christ. But you have to believe in the real Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist that replaces him or all the Antichrist philosophies that try and oppose what the Word of God says. Okay, back down to our slides. It says in verses 5 to 7, true believers walk in the light. We're called to walk in the light. True believers, in verses 8 to 10, are once forgiven and constantly cleansed. Now I'm going to read this slide and then I'm going to emphasize it, okay? We're to be confessing and being cleansed only when we agree with God about our sin. By the way, the word uh, confess right here is the, the Greek word homo. Legeo. That's a Greek word, homo legeo. Homo means the same. Legeo means the, the, tr the words about the same. So we say the same words. This is how I wrote it. We agree with God about our sin. There's a difference between admitting you sin and agreeing with God. And look what it says in verse 9. That, that we're supposed to study confession and forgiveness, not let our pride make us think, you know, I'm not as bad as, as others. This is what we need to focus on. Now, let me do that with you. Grab your Bible again and follow along. I'm going to start in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's the benefit of having a study Bible. Because in Greek, there's a great difference between those two parts of verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. It sounds like confess, forgive, confess, forgive. And if you forget to confess, he'll forget to forgive. Doesn't it sound like that? Mm -hmm. That's not what it says. And in your study Bible, you'll find that confess, the first Greek verb, is a constant, ongoing, present active indicative. I am characterized by agreeing with God. Listen to what it says in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. But if we're confessing our sins, that means I'm constantly saying, Oh, Lord, I didn't have a Christ-like attitude there. Oh, Lord, that thought, I, you know, I want to abstain from any fleshly thought. Oh, Lord, I was impatient. If we're confessing, we're agreeing with what God says about our behavior. He is faithful and just. Now, this is the good part. To once and for all forever have already forgiven us of our sins. Look at this. When Jesus died on the cross, 
Here's the cross. It was in about 30 AD. I came to Christ in 1962. Today is 2022. In 1960, I was born, I was six years old. So in 1956, right there, I was born a sinner and, and sinned for six years until my mother shared the gospel with me in 1962. And in 1962, I called on the name of the Lord and Jesus, who died on the cross 2,000 years ago, said, I forgive you for all of your sins from when you were born through today in 2022 and until the last day that you live on earth before I take you home for your lifetime. See? Lifetime. Birth to death. Jesus, once and for all, by one sacrifice, remember our lesson on, on the book of Hebrews? By one sacrifice, not constant sacrifices, that's one of those errors of religion. One sacrifice, he's already forgiven us. Now, if you, uh, that's well written out in those study notes. If you get a hold of that, it's life transforming. It makes me want to have a decreasing frequency of sinning against the Lord, an increasing frequency of responding to him. But I live in holy confidence that 1 John 5.13, look at this. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, that your sins are forgiven, that you and I are supposed to be constantly agreeing with God every time we sin, and we still sin. 1 John 1 8 says, Don't deceive yourself. We're still sinners by nature and by choice and by divine decree, but we have been forgiven once and for all. Every sin Jesus paid for on the cross from the day of my first breath on earth through the day I called on the name of the Lord and was saved through today and to my last day, and I know I'm forgiven. Okay, back to the slides. Um, Number seven, now remember these are my observations, 1 John 2, 3 to 6, true believers obey Christ's commands, and we've already covered that, John 14, 21. And then my eighth observation is, true believers resist the deceptions of the Antichrist, and that takes us to this concluding thought, the only safe place is to have the security the real Christ gives. The only protection from the ultimate angel of deception named Satan is the signature of God. When you call upon Christ in repentant faith, God saves you. Salvation is the greatest work of God in the universe. What is salvation? Well, 50 years ago, a man in a penitentiary, he was in prison. He signed up for a Moody Correspondence course, that great uh, Bible teaching institution in Chicago. He got saved. And in answer to one of the questions, you know, he would write and mail back and forth his lessons. He wrote on his uh, little study guide, and this is in a Moody publication. I read this. It's just a beautiful story. He said, here I am in prison, but I am a new man in an old body. It was the most perceptive remark. That's what salvation is. But it will go even further than that saved prisoner realized. One day, each of us will be a new person in a new body. I like to call the work of salvation the signature of God. God writes himself across our lives. And here's a summary of what happened to every one of us who come to faith uh, in God through Christ. And, and what I'm going to list off for you right now, I would encourage you, write them in your Bible, believe them, live them, and share them uh, with people. I was sharing these thoughts this morning with Ted. Number one, regeneration. That's when God changes my heart. Here's the verse. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That's regeneration. In 1962, when I called the name of the Lord, that's what happened to me. I was converted. That's when God changed my life. Matthew 18, 3. Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of God. Conversion means we're born again. We have a new heart and a, and a brand new life. We start out from the beginning like a baby. And what does the Lord say? Repentance is when God changes my mind. Matthew 3, 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now look up. 
Repentance is a change of mind that leads me to a change of behavior. So I'm going this way toward destruction. I'm convicted. I repent, which means I say, Lord, I agree with you about my sin. And that leads me to saying no to sin and yes to Christ. A change in behavior is what repentance is all about. Back to the slides. What does God do when I repent and believe and am regenerated and converted? God changes my family. I I get into his family. Look at this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. And the Spirit lives within us. And we could say, Abba, Father. And we're heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Wow. The next lesson, sanctification. This is my usefulness to God. God changes my behavior. Hebrews 10 says, for by one offering he's perfected. See, God is committed to maturing us, growing us. We are being sanctified. That's useful to God. The Holy Spirit witnesses to us. This is the covenant I'll make with them. I will put my laws in their heart and their minds. I will write them. That's why every time we read the word of God, the anointing of the spirit teaches us we are justified. By the way, these are not in order. Uh, this is just a uh, listing. God changes my state. Uh, I move from one state to another. I move from lostness to becoming a saint, to being saved to becoming God's child. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, totally by faith. And, and what is justification? I, I've told you this many times. I'll, I'll use the illustration of my little Bible here. Justification is that I was here dead in my trespasses and sin. Jesus came and bought me, that's redemption, and justified me. How did he justify me? He raised me up to, to be holy in God's sight. This is how he did it. On the cross, God treats Jesus like he committed every sin I'll ever commit. And he punished Jesus like he committed them. And then listen, at the moment of salvation, I'm justified when Jesus places on me his righteousness. So here is me. Here are all my sins. On the cross, all my sins went on Jesus. And when I called on the name of the Lord and he saved me, he put all of his righteousness on me. Do you know what God calls me? Saint John. Do I feel like a saint? Not very often. Do I act like a saint? More and more and more and more. Less and less and less sin. More and more response. But God says, I see you already as you will be in heaven, seated with me around the table. That's the wonder of justification. Back to the slides. So justification, God changed my state. Whoop, I'm going the wrong direction. Here we go. Glorification is the last one. It's when God changes my location. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. That's why he's preparing a place for me uh, in heaven, John 14 tells us. And 1 Thessalonians 4 says he's coming back to get me. Well, real quickly, every lesson, we end with this. I, I've found all my lessons. Now I want to apply it. And I'm just going to pray this before we go. Uh, this is what I wrote this morning. Lord, I want to walk in the light, confessing my sins, full of joy, cleansed each day, and fellowshipping with you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Next slide. Uh, just three applications that I would encourage you today while you're watching this movie. Start, start in this direction. What are you doing to learn to cling to healthy doctrines? Some responses to the truth God desires are, number one, learn some healthy verses. Start learning verses that support key doctrines. By the way, we have a list on our website of 108 verses every believer ought to know. If you want to be protected from deception, get that list and try and learn one verse every week for the next two years. Now here's a picture of our website. It's discoverthebook.org. There's a tab, you know, across the top, it has these tabs and one of them says, free downloadable resources, or it just says resources, I guess. Look at what the very first resource is. 108 verses, New American, New King James, New International, uh, King James Version, all kinds of other free resources. 
That's the card, remember, I carry in my wallet and read to Bonnie. This is also what I have stuck in my Bible, God's plan for me as an older man. If you're a, a younger woman or an older woman, there's the same card for you. And there's even all the resources I've shown about Roman Catholic. There's just pages of this stuff. So go to that website, number one, get some healthy verses. Um, whoop. Number two, get a healthy study Bible. Look up. Here's my MacArthur study Bible. This is the 49th week, I'm telling you. You need one of these. What happens if the whole internet goes down? You have a paper Bible. What happens if they someday close off orthodox doctrine, you know, evangelical doctrine on the internet? You have your own copy. See, you need this to be studying. In fact, a great retreat is to take the Bible and read the study notes. That's what I encourage you to do every week. We're doing our 52 chapter study. So get a healthy study Bible and healthy doctrine. This is Wayne Grudem. And, and the reason, and I'll tell you again, for the 49th time, why I like this, not because uh, I completely agree with Wayne Grudem. That's not why. It's because Wayne Grudem is one of the greatest living theologians I've ever met. Bonnie and I had lunch with him in, in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Phoenix Seminary. He is a brilliant man who loves God's word and who has taken the time to study every one of systematic theology's main doctrines. Uh, this book has like 1,700 pages. And let me read to you. Uh, the doctrine of the word of God, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, of the Holy Spirit, the application of redemption, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the future, and then all the apostolic confessions. And listen to what he did. I've never seen this before. For every doctrine, say here's a hot one, uh, pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, Number one, he researched everything the Anglicans and Episcopalians said about that doctrine. Then everything the Arminians, which are the Wesleyans and the Methodists. And then everything the Baptists said about it. Then everything the Dispensationalists said, said about it, like Dallas Seminary. Everything the Lutherans said about it, like Martin Luther. And then everything that the Reformed or Presbyterian, like John Calvin and Jonathan Edwards and all those, and then everything the Renewal, Charismatic, and Pentecostal said. And then finally, everything from Roman Catholic traditional and post-Vatican II. Unbelievable for every doctrine. And he lists them off in this book. That's why I love it. I can look at what I believe, and then I can look at what they believe, and I can understand why what they believe is wrong and why what I believe is right from Thousands of scripture references he ties to these doctrines. So back to the slides. Use a healthy study Bible and reference a healthy theology book. And of course, uh, you'll see down in the recommendations at the bottom in the description of this video, links to MacArthur's study Bible and Wayne Grudem's. Here's my two final challenges. Find someone you can share your findings with in application prayer and pray for us. There's my wonderful wife, Bonnie. Okay, look up. And, and we're about to go. This is week 49. Please take the time to go through, work on these doctrines, work on understanding. Jesus warned about deceivers. What, a, what an immense message this is from the last apostle, last epistle. he just written the Gospels, last book of the Bible. Understand the difference between Antichrist, little a, and the Antichrist. Avoid Satan's most powerful deceptions. By the gateway to freedom, what's that? Salvation. Freedom from emptiness, Jesus wants you full and overflowing. Freedom from guilt, Jesus wants you knowing that the stain of sin is gone forever. That's why I love to lead people to the Lord. The joy they have. I, I just watched a video of a young lady who came to Christ, I've told you about her, uh, watching the John 10 video. Her joy in the waters of baptism uh, as she gave her testimony, and then as she was put beneath the water, buried under the water, and then raised up, just the smile on her face. Freedom from guilt, freedom from deception, being sealed by the Holy Spirit, freedom from fear. How do you, how do you promote that? Once you're saved, fill your mind with healthy verses. Uh, start studying the Bible, not just reading it, studying the details in a healthy study Bible. And then... 
look up some of these key doctrines and understand healthy doctrines. Well, that's, that's the end of uh, this week, launching you into a wonderful week in 1 John. When we come back next week, we're going to be on week 50, which is introducing Revelation. I can't tell you how important it is that you finish. And for some of you who've jumped in today, then keep going this way and then go back to Genesis and go through. And by the way, if you haven't done, you know, lessons 1 to 48, they're building. And so for some of you, I'd encourage you just start today and kind of get in the habit because next week's really exciting with Revelation. By the way, the next week's going to be even more exciting. And then the finale is unbelievable. But I want you to get in the Word, find the truth, and then pray for God's transformation. And then along the way, get these resources and become men and women who know the truth, who defend the truth, and who disciple others. God bless you. John Barnett, my wonderful wife Bonnie, saying, I hope this is a transformational week for you. See you next week. <laughs>